Welcome to From Care to Cure, an educational webinar series presented by the Massachusetts General Hospital Frontal Temporal Disorders Unit. My name is Katie Brand, and I am the Director of Caregiver Support Services and Public Relations for the MGH FTD Unit. It is my happy role to coordinate educational opportunities for our community of persons living with a diagnosis, care partners, and healthcare professionals. We hope that these educational opportunities will improve the understanding, care, and treatment of frontal temporal dementia, atypical Alzheimer's disease, and related conditions. From Care to Cure aims to empower families with knowledge and information presented by our expert team of staff and clinicians. To open our 2021 series, it is my pleasure to introduce our director, Dr. Brad Dickerson. Dr. Brad Dickerson is a behavioral neurologist and neuroscientist dedicated to the sophisticated, compassionate, and multidisciplinary care of patients with neurodegenerative disorders, including primary progressive aphasia, Alzheimer's disease, frontal temporal dementia, posterior cortical atrophy, and related disorders. He is the Tommy Rickles Endowed Chair in Primary Progressive Aphasia Research, Director of the MGH Frontal Temporal Disorders Unit, Leader of the Neuroimaging Corps of the MGH Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, and a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Dickerson runs a multidisciplinary team of 30 clinicians and scientists using advanced brain imaging and behavioral methods to study how memory, language, emotion, and social behaviors change in normal aging and in patients with neurodegenerative disease. His team also studies new approaches to caregiving. As a neuroscientist, Dr. Dickerson has made contributions to the investigation of neuroimaging and cognitive behavioral abnormalities in a variety of neurodegenerative diseases. His contributions have provided new fundamental insights into brain behavior relationships in these diseases, some of which have been translated into key advances in diagnosis, monitoring, and prognostication. Because of his internationally regarded research expertise, he's been invited to write multiple reviews and editorials, participate in or lead multiple national and international research committees, and he received the prestigious Norman Geschwind Award in Behavioral Neurology from the American Academy of Neurology. Dr. Dickerson has sustained National Institute of Health funding for 17 years and has been the principal investigator on more than two dozen federal or foundation grants. Dr. Dickerson served as the executive committee of the Alzheimer's Association Neuroimaging Professional Interest Area, most recently as chair, and he chaired the 2019 Alzheimer's Imaging Consortium Research Meeting, which was attended by more than 700 researchers from around the world. He served on the Scientific Program Committee for the 2020 Alzheimer's Association International Conference. In addition to his accomplishments in investigation, Dr. Dickerson has an international reputation for clinical expertise, having contributed substantially to the diagnostic criteria for frontal temporal dementia and posterior cortical atrophy. Because of his clinical expertise, he's been invited to give lectures, including a keynote lecture at the 2019 World Congress of Neurology, and to contribute chapters and editorials by an international array of colleagues and is on multiple corporate scientific advisory boards. He co-edited a widely regarded 2014 textbook, Dementia, Comprehensive Principles and Practice, which is now undergoing a revision and expansion for its second edition. He also edited a 2016 textbook, Hodges Frontal Temporal Dementia, which has now become the definitive reference on these diseases. He is chair of the Alzheimer's Association, Massachusetts, New Hampshire Medical and Scientific Advisory Board and chair elect of the National Association for Frontal Temporal Dementia's Medical Advisory Council. In addition to investigation and clinical expertise, 
Dr. Dickerson has also contributed substantially to teaching. He has provided major mentorship roles to more than 60 mentees at a variety of levels, including serving on the dissertation committees of graduate students, being a primary mentor for postdoctoral clinical or research fellows, and mentoring individuals in the transition from postdoctoral trainees to junior faculty. But for many families, the most important accolade on Dr. Dickerson's resume is his role as an expert guide and partner for the journey of caring for a loved one living life with a progressive dementia. It is my honor to turn it over to Dr. Dickerson for the first presentation of our From Care to Cure 2021 educational series, an overview of FTD and atypical Alzheimer's disease. Hello, I'm Brad Dickerson, neurologist and director of the Massachusetts General Hospital Frontotemporal Disorders Unit. Our mission in the MGH FTD unit is to provide the best clinical care we can to provide comprehensive diagnostic evaluation of patients suspected of having frontotemporal dementia or related disorders involving a multidisciplinary team of clinicians. We want to provide comprehensive treatment and continuity care with the goal of managing symptoms, maximizing overall function, daily life, using a variety of approaches, approaches and helping patients and families understand what may be coming next for them. We want to provide social support and assist in connecting patients and families with community resources, provide genetic counseling where it's appropriate in patients that may seem to be in families uh, with familial conditions, and provide autopsy services for ultimate pathologic diagnosis. Not everyone wants to do this, but we engage in these discussions often early in the process to hear the voice of the patient. And this is ultimately what can tell us what the underlying biology of the disease is uh, that the person was affected by, which has implications not only for closure in their course of illness, but also for whether or not family members might be at elevated risk of having a condition like that, and for advancing our understanding of research as well. In terms of our mission related to the education and training of the next generation, we aim to train clinician researchers as specialists in this field or with specialized skills in the field and have trained many uh, wonderful clinicians and scientists in speech language pathology, neurology, psychiatry, internal medicine, psych psychology and neuroscience, as well as neurology and psychiatry residents, medical students, grad students, research assistants, undergraduates, and even high school students. We have an annual Harvard Dementia CME continuing medical education course, uh, and we have a book that I edited that um, illustrates the uh, uh, advanced thinking in the field by a number of um, scientists and leading researchers around the world, and as well as clinicians. Our mission in terms of research is to develop better methods to assess the presence and severity of symptoms in daily life, to develop better instruments to objectively measure performance on tests of language, social and emotional behavior, and cognition, and to en en enhance advanced brain imaging technologies for measuring brain structure function and molecular biomarkers of the disease as well as in different types of fluids uh, like blood and spinal fluid. We want to improve the accuracy of early diagnosis, enable prediction of types and rates of progression, monitor progression with an eye toward markers to measure the effects of potential therapies, identify rehabilitative strategies to try to improve daily function. And a lot of our research is increasingly turning toward research on the patient and care partner experience and how we can promote resilience in people dealing with these issues and how we can develop evidence for the effectiveness of uh, patient and care partner educational and behavioral interventions to improve quality of life so that one day those may be paid for. We also study neuromodulation uh, such as uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation to try to see if stimulating certain brain networks might be able to improve their function. Ultimately, we want to contribute to the clinical trials of the future where we have all these different measures, biomarkers that measure decline over time and increasing pathology. And then we want to try to give people disease modifying therapies as early as possible, flatten out the trajectory of pathological uh, processes that are occurring in the brain, slow down the decline in, in brain function and structure, and ultimately slow down the person's symptoms so that they can maintain quality of life for as long as possible. We know that slowing down the course of the illness may not always be what patients and families would want. And so we're sensitive to the fact that that's an important thing to take into consideration depending on where the person is in their illness. 
it's really through the dedication of many um, invested and passionate and talented professionals, scientists, clinicians, and budding clinician scientists that we're able to do the work we do. And it's through partnerships with you, our community of patients and families and others who are invested in the clinical practice, education, and research that we do, that we can make all of this possible. Without your participation, we can't advance the research, and we want to do the research to ultimately not only be able to provide the best care for people and their families with FTD, atypical Alzheimer's disease, and related disorders today, but find the cures for these diseases and disorders in the future. I'm going to provide an overview of our work and of the um, disorders called frontotemporal dementia and also touch a little bit on atypical Alzheimer's disease. Let's start with a couple of cases. And I like to call these the, the all too common long and winding road to diagnosis. Some people's journeys are longer than others. This is an 82 year old retired school principal who was living on her own with gradually worsening memory loss over five years who was increasingly repeating herself, forgetting important information her kids tell her, seemed disoriented at times, uh, started making mistakes paying bills and cooking meals. And the kids were pushing her to get an evaluation, but she says her medical checkups with her PCP are fine. Recently though, she was taken to the emergency room because she passed out for unclear reasons. After a full evaluation, the conclusion was that she may have accidentally taken too much of her blood pressure medication. Despite her resistance, the kids prompt her to see a neurologist who, after a brief evaluation, say she may have Alzheimer's disease and that she should probably stop driving and move to an assisted living community. A pretty jarring pronouncement to make after what sounded like a brief interaction. But this is a all too common scenario where a patient is increasingly forgetful beyond what you would typically think of as um, part of the normal aging process, which we're still trying to understand and um, in this case probably forgot that she took her blood pressure medication and didn't have a system to help her avoid mistakes like that. And so we often see medical complications, whether it's with blood pressure, diabetes medicines, or other medical illnesses that bring the gravity of memory loss or related cognitive symptoms to our attention. Here's a different story. This is a 52 year old manager for a large corporate group who began having word finding difficulty and increasingly was making mistakes while talking or would speak more vaguely and was let go from his job of 23 years. The PCP's evaluation was inconclusive but a possible diagnosis of depression was considered and he was prescribed a medication. Over the next year, he tried to find another job but his communication abilities uh, were becoming increasingly uh, noticeable to others in terms of the, the problems that he was having and it made it difficult to get through job interviews. He and his wife were struggling to make ends meet. His wife finally prompted a referral to a neurologist who performed a brain MRI and referred him to a neuropsychologist. The results were initially inconclusive with a possible diagnosis of what was called primary progressive aphasia and a referral to a speech language pathologist who gave him word exercises that didn't seem to help, leaving the patient and the family frustrated by the um, vague diagnosis and the lack of clear guidance from the medical community. So this is a big picture view of the spectrum of neurodegenerative dementias. And um, generally speaking, what this shows is that um, uh, as pathology accumulates in the brain, and I'll talk more about the specifics of this later, um, that starts early in the course of, the, of, of um, uh, prior to any symptoms, and we're increasingly able to measure so-called biomarkers of these pathologies, mainly Alzheimer's right now, but uh, working toward others. And we can see those starting to accumulate sometimes in people who are normal, and we call that the preclinical stage of the illness. Um, but as brain systems function begins to decline, shown here in red, and as changes in thinking, behavior, or sensory and motor ab abilities begin to uh, be, pre be present, we talk about this as the prodromal stage. This is when things are starting to be apparent, but it's not clear in many cases. And we talk about this as mild cognitive or behavioral impairment when people are still largely independent in their functioning. And eventually uh, this fuzzy line is crossed when people become um, dependent on others for activities that are, relate to their thinking abilities and that they're no longer able to do for themselves anymore. And that's dementia. And that can uh, span a wide spectrum from mild to moderate to severe. 
So what's, what are the goals of the diagnostic evaluation when people are being assessed? I like to think about the first goal is trying to define the clinical illness. How has the person changed? And we start with what is the patient's overall cognitive functional status? And I'll unpack that in a little bit, but that's basically, do they have dementia? Do they, what is the stage of dementia? Do they have mild cognitive impairment? Are there just subjective concerns that we don't find evidence for when we do testing? And then is there a recognizable syndrome, a cognitive behavioral constellation of symptoms and signs on um, history and testing that fit with one of the syndromes that we recognize as being um, associated with certain pathologic features in the brain or and, and typically certain uh, prognosis? And are there other important accompanying clinical features like changes in movement, uh, changes in mood or uh, behavior, other medical conditions that may be contributing or may be muddying the picture. And then how do we understand what the brain disease or disorder or disorders are that are causing these changes? That's typically done through laboratory imaging or biomarker evidence that will sometimes give us fairly specific evidence for a certain brain disease and other times lead to a less conclusive understanding of what the causes or contributors are to a person's illness. And then of course, how can we use all of this information to develop a comprehensive treatment and care plan? So this is the schematic that we like to use to try to relate these three steps of the diagnostic formulation to each other. And I'll go through each of those in, in a moment. But uh, the first two of them, the cognitive functional status and the cognitive behavioral syndrome are really understood by a structured interview with the patient and an informant, someone who knows them well and can provide details of the history, and that may be more than one person, depending on um, the patient's activities. And those are the symptoms, the way a person has changed in their day-to-day -day life. And then there are the signs of the uh, illness, which are based on the testing in the office uh, of cognition and thinking, the neurologic exam, the psychiatric interview, and sometimes the neuropsychological testing or speech language pathological testing, if those are done. So those are the first two steps. Let me, let me walk you through those. So the overall cognitive functional status is really defined by the loss of independent functioning due to cognitive impairment, regardless of exactly what its nature is. And this um, uh, grid shows uh, cognitively normal people on the left, subjective cognitive decline, where people feel that they're experiencing symptoms of cognitive changes, but we may not be able to detect anything on testing. Sometimes that ultimately is determined to be related to um, just normal aging and maybe a worse experience with it than average, but no obvious uh, disease process or condition that's responsible. Other times it's the very beginning of what turns out to be an illness that can be recognized later. Then there's mild cognitive impairment where people have evidence on testing typically of impairments in memory or thinking abilities, um, but where they're still largely independent in their day-to-day -day life. And then we get into very mild uh, and mild dementia where people may not be uh, obviously um, abnormal in the way they think and communicate um, to a casual observer. But by the time you get into moderate or severe or very advanced or terminal stages of dementia, uh, it's uh, obvious to a casual observer that something's wrong with the person. So how do we think about the levels of independent functioning that enable us to determine this? <clears throat> Starting at the bottom, I like to think about the basic activities of daily living that all of us need to do to get through the day, eating, dressing, grooming, dental care, walking, bathing, toileting. These are the kinds of uh, activities of daily living that are lost in people with severe dementia. Above that, there are the instrumental activities of daily living, and that's responsibility for taking our own medications, ability to handle basic household finances, getting from one familiar place to another, either by driving or using some form of transportation, uh, food preparation, shopping, ability to use the telephone, housekeeping, and laundry. These activities are generally um, lost completely by the time a person's in uh, moderate stages of dementia, uh, or may be partially preserved at a very simple level, such as just being able to put together a, a sandwich in the kitchen or um, uh, maybe you uh, microwave a prepared dinner. And then there's the advanced activities of daily living. And these vary a lot more between individuals. And that's where you really have to take the context of the person's background uh, into consideration. So this is performance at work, 
uh, or me mental tasks that were involved in the former job the person had, handling more complex financial issues, uh, holding positions of leadership in community organizations, actively paying attention to and understanding the uh, plot of a movie, TV program, book, or magazine, and being able to discuss it, participating in complex games, navigating to unfamiliar areas, keeping paperwork organized, developing a schedule in advance of anticipated events, uh, fixing things, doing projects, um, and using technology. And these are, again, highly variable, but in general, things that when they are lost often are um, uh, happening at the milder stages of dementia. So let's think now about the cognitive behavioral syndrome. Um, these are the domains of cognitive and behavioral function that are listed in the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health. They're not the only way to break things down, but it's a reasonable way to organize things. So we've got complex attention, just processing stimuli that are coming in, whether it's people talking to you or what you see. Executive function, the ability to plan, organize, and complete tasks or projects. I like to talk about that as the chief executive officer in our brains that we all need to have in order to get things done in our lives. Then there's learning and memory, um, acquiring, manipulating, and remembering information of a variety of types, and that can be broken down into different types of memory. Then there's perceptual motor skills, being able to interact with our environment, devices, other people, and so forth language, and then social cognition. And, and this is not just cognitive, but also emotional when it comes to interacting with other people. And these abilities are controlled by a variety of different brain systems, brain networks. Uh, and you can see that the um, colors indicate a, an individual network. And you can see from, for example, the green network has parts in the frontal lobe, parts in the parietal lobe, parts back in the back of the temporal lobe where it intersects with the occipital lobe. And these different networks are involved in seeing things like in the occipital lobe here, um, hearing things um, here in the top of the temporal lobe, understanding or producing language in this brick colored um, set of regions in the usually in the left hemisphere. Um, the inside of the temporal lobe down here is involved in remembering information. And then this orange colored area is um, both in the frontal and parietal lobe, but that's part of what is a, a network that's involved in executive function. So you can see how these are distributed around the brain and uh, different diseases can affect them by hitting them at, at different locations. But it's really all about the location of the problem in the brain, not so much the exact nature of the problem, which is one of the things that makes these diseases complicated. So here's a patient this is a patient with gradually progressive, still at the MCI stage, uh, amnesia, uh, what's called an amnesic or an amnestic syndrome. And this is likely due to Alzheimer's. And this would be what we would often think of as a typical form of Alzheimer's disease. So this is a man in his 70s, um, educated, retired tax attorney with gradually increasing forgetfulness over the past two years, getting to the point where uh, the straw that broke the camel's back that led his family to push him to come in for an evaluation was when he had a complete memory lapse of a Super Bowl party they had hosted just the following week. And he and his wife and daughter had said that he had not been drinking much, um, but really couldn't remember that they even had the party at their house, which alarmed them. He was still though doing family taxes, but taking longer, serving on a local housing uh, community board and playing golf. Uh, and the initial exam in the PCP's office concluded that it wasn't obvious that something was wrong. The mini mental test, which has a 30 point scale, was 28 out of 30, which is generally within normal limits. But the two things that he missed were two of the memory items on the test, which obviously is highly salient given the concerns that led his family to bring him to the doctor. So when he was referred to a neurologist for a more in-depth exam, he had trouble learning a list of words. The same list of 12 words was repeated five times. And he really didn't learn as much as he should, four words, four words, six words, seven words, and seven words with each repetition. And then after a delay, he could only remember three of the words that he had initially drilled into his mind and had some difficulty even with the multiple choice options uh, to recognize the words that he had heard, only getting nine out of 12 and thinking that two of the words that were not words he had heard uh, had been heard before. Otherwise, his cognitive function was intact. His MRI scan shows the probably two most common um, patterns of these diseases in the brain as we get older. 
which are uh, shrinkage of the hippocampus, the, this structure here and here are the two structures called the hippocampi. There's one on each side of the brain. And this man's hippocampi are smaller than they should be. They should fill in more of this space with the black in, uh, being fluid that surrounds parts of the brain. And when there's more black around a part of the brain uh, or in the ventricles inside the brain, it tells you that that, that part of the brain has shrunken. And then uh, in the image at the right, you can see these white spots, which is evidence of so-called small vessel cerebrovascular disease of the brain, which is basically a form of blood vessel disease of the brain, sort of the modern equivalent of what we used to talk about as hardening of the arteries. No actual strokes, but a real risk factor for stroke and a real part of the disease process of what the um, um, cerebrovascular disease does to the brain. And the arrows indicate those patterns. So unfortunately, this man, we diagnosed him with mild cognitive impairment, probably due to Alzheimer's along with cerebrovascular disease. And he had a fairly rapid progression from the diagnosis and the symptom onset to mild dementia, moderate dementia with agitation, nursing home placement, uh, severe dementia with a Parkinson's-like um, movement change, and then death due to aspiration pneumonia, unfortunately. And when he was uh, placed in the nursing home, there was a question because of the relatively abrupt onset of agitation about whether he might have had a frank stroke mm -hmm. given the cerebrovascular disease we'd seen. And so uh, we got another MRI scan. And what this shows really is pretty significant, substantial progression of the shrinkage of his brain. You can see how much smaller the hippocampi are uh, in this right image compared to the previous image and how much bigger the ventricles are. And you can see a lot more shrinkage out in the cortex here uh, throughout the different parts of the brain that control not just memory, but other kinds of thinking abilities like executive function and language, which he was having trouble with. So in general, this is a more rapid uh, uh, decline than what you typically see in Alzheimer's, but it, it, the presentation initially is a fairly typical type of Alzheimer's. And I'll be contrasting that to other um, uh, forms of Alzheimer's disease as well. So what are the major clinical syndromes of dementia? There's this one that I was just talking about, a um, memory problem, which is an amnesia, problems in learning and recall of recently learned information. There's uh, a type that is related to executive dysfunction, problems with organizing, planning, making decisions, and so forth. There's an aphasia type with problems with language, which I'll talk about more later in terms of expression or understanding of words. There's problems with visual spatial function. We often talk about this as agnosia, problems with sense of direction, location in space, seeing or recognizing objects, problems with personality and social or emotional behavior, mood or behavioral symptoms. Sometimes this occurs in the context of other kinds of cognitive symptoms. Sometimes this is the predominant feature at the very beginning as it is in behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. And then uh, changes in motor function, such as uh, control of movement, which we call apraxia. And that can affect the hands or affect walking or affect movements of the face or eyes, including speech. So these are the major ways that people initially present when they have one of these conditions. And often they're still independent uh, when they initially present. And so their syndrome uh, may be expressed at a time when they're still largely independent, or it may come on pretty synonymously with loss of function. And the atypical syndromes, as we like to talk about the uh, dementias that are not predominantly memory loss and organizational problems, are much more common in young onset uh, cases under the age of 65. This is where we see atrophy or shrinkage in a computerized map of MRI scans from people with typical mild stage Alzheimer's dementia. And you can see that the memory systems in the inside of the brain where the hippocampus and nearby structures are, are always affected. Some of the systems in the bottom of the temporal lobe that help us understand what objects are and who people are is uh, typically affected. Some of the parts of the frontal and parietal and temporal lobes are affected that are involved in executive function, language, and visual spatial processing. So uh, many patients have multiple uh, impairments and are not just impaired in one of these domains when they initially present. And that's fairly common in Alzheimer's disease. So why is this important? Why is understanding the clinical syndrome important? It labels the patient's or family's experience of the illness. Uh, so for example, mild amnesic and disexecutive um, dementia uh, with or without mood or behavioral or motor symptoms is a pretty common label. It's a mouthful of words. It doesn't have a specific name, but it's got a fairly specific uh, explanation. 
This helps identify symptoms for therapy of various sorts, like amnesia is often responsive to the medicine called donepazil, also known as Aricept and related medicines. Uh, memory cues and strategies may be helpful. Uh, whereas if it's aphasia, speech language therapy to develop compensatory strategies to more effectively communicate tend to be the approach. The syndrome also captures some elements of care planning and support needs. Um, so where may a structured routine, possibly with a care companion be important? Um, how can we tailor our education and psychosocial support to the patient and care partner's needs? And it also connects them with appropriate community resources, such as the Alzheimer's Association, Association for FTD, the Cure PSP organization, or the Lewy Body Association, or others. And also connects people with research, including clinical trials that may be targeting their specific condition. So here's another list and way to think about it. We've got um, the domain on the left and a descriptive term for the impairment syndrome on the right. And you can see that some of these are just inversions of the, of the word itself. So attention, inattentive syndrome, executive function, disexecutive syndrome, language, aphasic syndrome, memory, amnesic syndrome, visual cognition, ag and agnosic or spatial dis dysfunction syndrome, uh, and so forth. Sometimes a single one of these domains is affected and other times multiple domains are affected at the beginning. So here's a patient with a uh, progressive aphasia. This, his particular form is called logopenic aphasia. That's the variant that he has. He's a retired engineer who presented with at age 70 with four years of progressive language and word finding difficulties. Uh, he and his wife began to observe word finding pauses and sound substitutions. He was having more difficulty getting words out was increasingly using uh, simpler words and talking around things, had difficulty naming common objects, could think of the object and describe it, but couldn't come up with a specific name for it. He also did, uh, noted a decline in some aspects of attention, especially when it came to listening to other people talk, but denied difficulties with problems with memory, comprehension, uh, other than the long conversations, visual spatial skills, executive function or math skills, and was very independent in his daily activities. We often use this picture in our assessments and ask people to describe what they see going on in this picture. So keep this picture in mind as you hear this patient's description. Looks like a family is, has a house of, I think it's a house or a friend's place on the lake. And the kids are having a good time. They're gonna have a picnic. Uh, and uh, we have somebody who's uh, finishing, efficient. So the kids are playing. Uh, uh, one is working, uh, is playing the girls, playing with, with uh, uh, putting together a sand castle. Uh, the boy is, uh, has a uh, kite. Uh, some friends are in the boat, in the sail, sail, sail boat. And they, I think they're uh, sort of waiting the wave. Yeah. And then unfortunately, uh, five years later, he really had minimal intelligible speech content uh, compared to that relatively mild aphasia where you could understand what he was, uh, the point he was trying to get across. Whoops. I'll probably give you the support to cut the cover and uh, the man in the southern water world or however, what they can get on the soft cars at the, 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 and, and then there's a, a little boy that's just fighting right at, at the lot of the, the uh, uh, that, see, see, I can't get to work the word left. I, I, I think I can put a part of a car to car to get of it, that, that uh, but a lot of, you push it and get it, get it. You really thought that you had a sense and through gestures, you could tell he really knew what he was trying to say largely, but uh, really was very difficult to understand. So comparing the MRIs from those two times, you can uh, see and, and uh, the patient's right is on our left as we typically display these images. Um, and what you can see is at the beginning, the main shrinkage was in this area called the left superior temporal gyrus, which is part of the language network. His memory structures down here, as, as we talked about in the last patient, are relatively normal looking. Uh, 
And then five years later, um, there's been a, a more prominent uh, shrinkage of that language area and areas around it, but also by then uh, other parts of the other systems of the brain, including the memory structures were affected. And you can see that with these surface maps uh, showing the first shrinkage being really restricted to that part of the language network. And then it gradually spreads over time in nearby areas and to connected areas. So this patient, uh, we, the family and he agreed to donate his brain and we found Alzheimer's disease pathology underlying his um, aphasia. So this is a, an example of a fairly classic case of an atypical form of Alzheimer's disease that is not what you typically think of as the disease doing, uh, where the pathology was located in atypical areas uh, than what it usually is. Let me illustrate another case to show that. This is a, a 78 year old former English professor who had gradual development of visual and spatial problems. She started to notice she hadn't seen something that she should have. She was missing turns while driving or walking. She decided herself to stop driving, but had otherwise intact instrumental activities of daily living. Uh, quite an accomplished woman, uh, but was finding herself increasingly unsure of where things are. She would look for her purse a bunch of times throughout the day had difficulty recognizing familiar people by their face, even including her son, but would recognize them when he, she heard his voice and sometimes when she saw him walking. She also had a change in her ability to carry out other visual tasks like reading maps, finding the letters on a keyboard and uh, knowing where to write her name and the numbers on a check. The neurologic exam showed abnormalities consistent with those symptoms, but she was otherwise intact. So we diagnosed her with mild cognitive impairment a visual or spatial predominant form without memory loss. Uh, it's a progressive visual spatial syndrome that's often referred to as the posterior cortical atrophy syndrome. Here's her MRI. And um, what this MRI shows is um, shrinkage. And again, this is the right side where the arrows are. And this is down uh, toward the bottom of the brain at the level of the eyes, as you can see here. Uh, and this is shrinkage of the so-called occipitotemporal region down at the bottom of the brain. And that processes what people see. And this would be um, responsible for the trouble recognizing her son from his face. Whereas over here on the image at the right, this is more uh, in going up from the occipital lobe into the parietal lobe. And this is so, the so-called where pathway for vision, which processes information about where things are that we see. And what you can see is even though the shrinkage was apparent on the MRI scan, if you really know what you're looking for, the glucose PET scan sh it shows in a much more obvious way the reduced metabolic activity. So this is a basic scan of brain function that shows us uh, parts of the brain in terms of the, their use of glucose, sugar, which all the brain cells need in order to function. And the arrows are pointing to places where functioning is lower than it should be in those areas I was just mentioning. And we can see from the amyloid PET scan, uh, because the pathology of Alzheimer's disease is amyloid plaques and tau tangles, that the amyloid plaques as visible from this amyloid PET scan are really not in the places where her brain is shrinking and not functioning properly. They're in places where they tend to like to go for reasons we don't understand, including the frontal lobes on both sides, the parietal lobes on both sides and parts of the temporal lobe. Whereas if we look back at the uh, glucose PET scan and now compare it to the tau PET scan, this is a PET scan that measures tau related tangles, we can see that they are almost mirror images of each other if we flip between them. The places in the brain that have lost functioning are the areas of the brain with the most prominent tau pathology. And you can see that the areas on the other side of the brain in the same vicinity that have lower levels of tau pathology also had um, slightly reduced functioning um, on the glucose PET scan. So um, this woman has, um, based on the amyloid plaques and the tau tangles from the PET scans, uh, pretty clear evidence that this uh, posterior cortical atrophy progressive visual syndrome is due to underlying Alzheimer's disease in the brain. And this is the other major atypical form of Alzheimer's disease uh, in terms of the way it affects people. The progressive aphasia form being one and the progressive visual spatial form being the other. There are other atypical forms of Alzheimer's disease as well, uh, including a, a predominantly disexecutive form that affects uh, reasoning and problem solving and a less common 
um, frontal behavioral form that looks like behavioral variant FTD, but is actually due to underlying Alzheimer's in the brain. And then also a um, uncommon form that looks like cortical basal syndrome, but turns out to be a motor presentation of Alzheimer's disease. So the more that we learn about the so-called biomarkers that allow us to measure these conditions in the brain, the more we see that they map uh, in probabilistic, but um, not perfect ways uh, onto the different clinical syndromes, uh, cognitive behavioral syndromes. Now I'm going to get specifically into frontotemporal dementia and frontotemporal lobar degeneration, and I'll explain the specifics of those terms in a moment. I wanna just start by talking about the demographics of frontotemporal dementia. It's thought to be the third most common neurodegenerative dementia after Alzheimer's and Lewy body disease, and uh, is really only about five to 15% of dementias, uh, so is generally fairly rare. Typically, it affects people at an earlier age, often in the 45 to 65 time frame. It may be the most common young onset dementia. Cases have been reported with onset as young as in their 20s and as old as in their 80s. In our program, we've seen people as young as 27 and as old as 86 in terms of the age of onset of their frontotemporal dementia that is subsequently autopsy confirmed. An estimate is that the prevalence in the United States is 60,000 cases, but this is likely an underestimate because of the challenges in making a diagnosis. Uh, it may be as common as 100 or even 150,000 people, but it's most likely fewer than 200,000, which makes it uh, technically defined as a rare disease. Some of the changes in personality or behavior that you can see in people with some forms of FTD may be viewed differently in different cultures. And so we have to keep that in our minds as we think about uh, how to identify the symptoms of these conditions as early as possible. And there's been relatively little investigation of FTD in underrepresented populations. So the clinical presentation is a slowly progressive decline in behavior or cognition. Um, patients often lack insight, which may delay symptom reporting, uh, especially with the behavioral variant, but sometimes the language variant uh, symptoms are often misdiagnosed as a psychiatric disorder. And there are different presentations that I'll talk, talk about in a moment. Typically, we diagnose with someone with possible FTD if we think that their symptoms may be suggestive of FTD, but we can't see evidence in the brain scans of changes in the frontal or temporal lobes, or probable uh, FTL, FTD if, the, uh, if those changes are visible on the imaging scans. And the field desperately needs better biomarkers of the underlying neuropathology, like uh, the field of Alzheimer's disease now has. And that's emerging slowly in the research um, world, and uh, we hope to have those in the not too distant future. So the diagnostic criteria for the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia is that a person should have at least three of the following symptoms early in the course of their illness. Behavioral disinhibition, uh, often talked about as loss of filter, apathy or inertia, where people um, stop being interested in things that they used to be interested in and are not depressed. Loss of sympathy or empathy, which is loss of the emotional connectedness with loved ones. Perseverative, stereotyped, or compulsive behavior, and this may be fairly simple kinds of tapping or more complex hoarding or other uh, kinds of behavior. Hyperorality or dietary changes, uh, sometimes an increased sweet tooth, sometimes a rigidity of preferences of foods of certain types. And a neuropsychological profile may be present where executive deficits are, are present, dis executive dysfunction with relative sparing of memory and visuospatial abilities. The um, primary progressive aphasia is the term given to the other variants uh, of, um, uh, of progressive aphasia language problems. The semantic variant of PPA is uh, really the loss of understanding of the meanings of words and concepts that leads people to say nonspecific things and sometimes not understand what others say to them. Later in the course of this uh, syndrome, people often develop a behavioral variant like behavioral symptoms. And then there's the non-fluent variant PPA with effortful, hesitant speech, often with um, agrammatic speech or breakdown of the normal syntactic structure of speech and writing in many cases. Sometimes this is accompanied by so-called apraxia of speech, which is a motor speech disorder that leads people's speech to sound different, often kind of robotic or monotone, or sometimes with articulatory errors where people don't pronounce words correctly. 
And sometimes people will subsequently develop uh, changes in movement um, of their hands or walking that uh, is reminiscent of some of the less common syndromes that I'll mention a little later. And then there's logopenic variant PPA, which I showed a case of earlier that um, is usually due to AD pathology. So it's italicized here because it's not typically considered to be a form of the diseases of frontotemporal lobar degeneration, but it's often lumped uh, into that because the um, clinical presentation and the uh, overall uh, care planning and needs a patient may have are, are often um, provided in programs that focus on FTD. So this is a broad spectrum of conditions, um, and these conditions are lumped under the term frontotemporal dementia as an umbrella term that describes people with these different syndromes. And they arise from the family of neurodegenerative brain diseases called FTLD, or frontotemporal lobar degeneration. And this is a family of diseases that affect those parts of the brain, the frontal or anterior temporal lobes. You can see in the MRI scan, the shrinkage of the frontal and temporal lobes. You can see in this postmortem brain image, the striking shrinkage of these parts of the brain with sparing of the back of the brain. And I listed at the top here, the three major syndromes that I just summarized, but there are several other syndromes, one called semantic dementia, where people lose their knowledge of things and it doesn't just affect language. It may affect their understanding of objects or people or other um, things, not just language. And then there are these syndromes that are often talked about as uh, FTD motor syndromes. And those include a condition called progressive supranuclear palsy, which is associated with uh, changes in balance and walking, often with falls that are unprovoked, changes in eye movements, uh, and sometimes can present with behavioral symptoms or with language and speech symptoms early on as well. And then there's the cortical basal syndrome, which is uh, typically associated with one-sided changes in hand movements or arm movements, sometimes legs as well. Um, and that uh, is, is often accompanied by cognitive and sometimes mood and behavioral symptoms as well. And then there are a host of, of syndromes in brackets at the bottom that ultimately are determined to be uh, due to frontotemporal lobar degeneration, but where the patient did not initially present as having one of these specific syndromes. And again, that's where we often don't know for sure what the person has um, until uh, autopsy. So the progression of FTD is that it often starts out distinctly as one of these variants, but often progresses to involve other domains. I like to talk about how people with the um, language variants often develop later on changes in social or emotional behavior or changes in movement. People with the behavioral variants often develop changes in movement or language. Um, and people with the movement variants often develop changes in um, thinking or mood and behavior. And depending on the type and location of changes in the brain, changes in uh, movement uh, may occur at different points in time, which has been a major topic of several FTD conferences recently. These can be in coordination, slowing and stiffness, changes in walking and falls, changes in eye movements or impaired swallowing. And I should mention uh, that frontotemporal dementia with motor neuron disease or FTD ALS can occur where people may start out having both symptoms of FTD and symptoms of, of Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS as it's called, or those may start um, by having one type of symptoms, type of symptom and then evolve to the other. Overall survival is uh, as few as two years or as long as 20 or more years after the onset of symptoms, but usually the survival on average is seven to 12 years with new findings coming out all the time on that. And this depends a lot on how early a diagnosis is made. Treatment is um, uh, primarily supportive. The medicines to slow disease progression, uh, which is true for uh, all of these conditions, really are in clinical trials and need further development have not been proven to work. Medicines to treat symptoms uh, with FTD, nothing yet has an uh, FDA label, but several studies have sh shown clear benefits of antidepressant medications on a variety of symptoms and uh, existing medicines may be helpful for managing various symptoms. In some cases, AD medicines may help. In other cases, AD medicines are contraindicated. They may actually exacerbate certain kinds of behavioral symptoms. Stimulants um, uh, typically are not that helpful, but sometimes are worth a try. Antipsychotic medications, anti-seizure medicines, and mood stabilizers can sometimes be helpful for certain symptoms. So that's where uh, expert 
expertise in, in um, medication management can be helpful, but really a comprehensive interdisciplinary team approach is what patients and families need, typically involving um, multiple team members with the expertise listed here um, and connection with community organizations, community um, care programs and organizations like the Alzheimer's Association or Association for FTD. Now I'm gonna to turn to the brain disease uh, themselves, the brain diseases themselves. And I list here uh, in my um, slide, Alzheimer's disease, frontal temporal lobe bar degeneration, cerebrovascular disease, and Lewy body disease. We talked a little bit earlier about uh, Alzheimer's disease and cerebrovascular disease. We haven't really touched on Lewy body disease uh, and I'll focus now on frontal temporal lobe bar degeneration. And these, uh, Likely, the likelihood of these diseases is typically determined by changes in brain structure on a CAT scan or an MRI, uh, specific abnormalities in brain function on a glucose PET scan, or sometimes a SPECT scan or even EEG, although those are less commonly used. And markers, so-called biomarkers of molecular brain pathology like amyloid or tau PET scan in the case of AD, um, even though I'll mention later tau PET scans are a holy grail goal in research on FTD, they don't work well yet and they're not useful in clinical practice. And then spinal fluid biomarkers and eventually blood biomarkers are uh, things that we're using and are moving toward using. The probably most important thing to recognize in FTD as we've been touching on already is the heterogeneity. And that's really, as I said earlier, related to the location of uh, changes in the brain. So uh, in the case of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex out here, that's where um, people often have executive dysfunction. Um, uh, and, and that's where the, I like to talk about the CEO of the brain is located. Um, here in, in the inside at the top of the frontal lobes is the spark plug of the brain. And when people have problems in the so-called anterior cingulate cortex or the spark plug area, they often become apathetic. They don't have the drive to do the things they used to. And down here at the bottom, right above the eyes uh, on the inside is the orbital frontal cortex. Uh, and those are what I call the breaks of the brain. And when people have problems, especially affecting those areas, they often become disinhibited. And then um, I'll talk more about this later in the left prefrontal cortex is Broca's area and nearby areas in the language circuit that often are abnormal in people with the non-fluent or agrammatic form of PPA. And down here in the temporal lobe um, is where parts of the so-called ventral language system are that help us understand the meanings of words and concepts. And that's what people with semantic variant PPA have problems with. So here's um, a, a glucose PET scan. And in clinical practice, its major use is in differentiating Alzheimer's disease from frontotemporal degeneration. And this is an, a healthy person's glucose PET scan. This is a glucose PET scan of a person with typical Alzheimer's disease where they have back of the brain, so-called temporoparietal hypometabolism in the back. And then this is a person with FTD where they have anterior temporal or frontal hypometabolism. And that can be seen in the case of FTD a little more clearly here where this person has very mild anterior temporal hypometabolism, but pretty normal frontal metabolism and the back of the brain is normal as well. Whereas this person who has more severe symptoms has a very low metabolism in the frontal lobes and anterior uh, front parts of the temporal lobes. So what are imaging biomarkers aiming to accomplish? We wanna use them to make an earlier diagnosis, be more confident in the diagnosis, and maybe think about them as the, uh, one of the entryways for getting into clinical trials of medications targeting the specific problem that's identified through these biomarkers. They also may be useful in prediction or prognosis, and we often try to incorporate that thinking into our discussions with patients and family members. And also for monitoring change over time, we can see the amount of change that is taking place over the course of a year or two years or sometimes uh, longer or shorter time periods and try to correlate that with changes in people's symptoms. And they can also be used as outcome measures in clinical trials where you would hope to slow the changes in and decline in the structure or function of the brain. And we're continuing to compare in our research, MRI and PET scans and others to try to see if they are giving us redundant information or complementary information or, or how best to use them uh, together. So here's some of the research that we do looking at the measurement through the uh, computational processing of MRI scans. 
of cortical thickness. So uh, the cortex is the sheet of brain cells that surrounds the outside of the brain. And you can see it in this darker gray band around the edges. And you can make a measurement of how thick it is if you have a sophisticated computer power. And you can see here how uh, in this person that had a temporal lobe shrinkage, uh, in this side of the brain, the cortex looks pretty good overall. Um, but in this side of the brain, you can see it's a lot thinner and it loses its, its sharp demarcation with the underlying white matter that it should have. And that's detectable in these computerized images that I like to show. And so you can see in the case that we were just looking at, uh, that patient had semantic variant PPA. And in our group of patients at MGH, you can see that in these images, this is where the shrinkage is in the brain, uh, mostly in the front of the left temporal lobe, getting up into a part of the brain called the insula. Um, bottom of the frontal lobe, um, and some on the on the inside of the frontal lobe as well. And what's remarkable is when we look at the Im neuroimaging initiative and FTD data set, which was a collaboration we did with UCSF and the Mayo Clinic, and in this case, we've taken our scans out and just compared the scans obtained at UCSF and the Mayo Clinic with ours, and there's a remarkably similar pattern across these two separate samples of patients. Same thing with non-fluent variant primary progressive aphasia, where our sample shows shrinkage in Broca's area and other parts of the frontal lobe uh, spilling over onto the inside of the top of the frontal lobe as well, and a little bit in the uh, back of the temporal lobe, and pretty similar uh, patterns of shrinkage in the um, uh, sample from UCSF and Mayo Clinic. And then here is a behavioral variant FTD, and you can see what almost looks like more of a combined pattern where there's frontal and anterior temporal lobe involvement spilling over onto the inside surface of both hemispheres, being more symmetrical. What's remarkable is how left lateralized uh, the uh, atrophy patterns are in people with PPA, which generally speaking in right-handed people is where the language networks are. But in BVFTD, it's a lot more symmetrical, um, but still involves a lot of the same structures if, if you um, compare these different patterns. So what about the pathology inside the brain if we look under the microscope? Here's the six layers of the cortex. I was just showing how you can measure from the outside to the inside uh, with MRI scans. But if you zoom in under the microscope, you can see all the brain cells in there uh, with zoomed in images of the neurons that have projections that, that receive information and send information. Uh, from the cell itself and uh, glial cells, as they're called, that are around the neurons that are also brain cells that are important in a supportive and, and potentially uh, immunologic way. And so what happens is you lose brain cells and the connections between them. And you can see almost what, what look like little holes in the brain in white here where there should be brain cells. And you also get the accumulation of abnormal forms of proteins. In this particular kind of cell uh, stain, you can see that um, there are things inside the brain cell, if you're a pathologist and you know what you're looking for here, that shouldn't be there. You can't quite tell what they are, um, uh, but you can, have, um, um, you can make a best prediction based on their shape and the types of cells they're in. Uh, but then you can use antibodies, um, like this image here shows an antibody to the protein called tau that shows that all those things are um, made up of abnormal tau deposits. And so what we know is if you look at the shape of cells, you can see things that are called pick bodies or other types of uh, things inside of cells that shouldn't be there. You can see what's called dystrophic neurites where the projections from the brain cell are not shaped normally. And often what's called reactive astrocytes or other glial cell pathology, basically the cells that make up the brain's immune system trying to come in and clean things up, but often being unsuccessful. And the proteins that are responsible are tau or TDP43 in the vast majority of cases. There are rarer types of uh, proteins uh, that occasionally occur, but these are the vast majority, and it's usually one of them or the other. Here's what they look like, um, and this, this is really a separate, we think, um, set of molecular pathologies with tau being at the top here and TDP43 being at the bottom here. And, and from what we understand so far, they're not related to each other and you don't tend to see both of them together, although the field continues to try to understand whether they might have relationships to each other. Uh, but for the most part, our questions are, does this patient's FTD 
um, uh, is this patient's FTD a, a tau type or a TDP43 type? And that's currently the thinking about what we need biomarkers for and how we might ultimately try to treat the underlying disease process. These are normal proteins in brain cells, um, most of whom's function has not been understood. And uh, a lot of the research on these diseases is really uh, helping us understand more about the normal functions of these brains, of these proteins in brain cells. But in these diseases, they become twisted and tangled and clump within cells. They uh, clog up the machinery. They aren't uh, able to be eliminated and they damage the cell and its internal workings and ultimately lead to cell death. And this only occurs for some reason in particular vulnerable cell types in certain brain regions. And we also don't understand why that is. Occasionally, this is because of a single genetic mutation, but most of the time we don't know the cause and it's not genetic. And this is the overall uh, relationship between the different uh, clinical syndromes, the different cognitive behavioral syndromes of FTD at the top and the FTLD pathologies at the bottom. Um, and what you can see with the colors is that if you have the progressive supranuclear palsy syndrome, then uh, you're highly likely to have one of the tau forms of FTLD in the brain, one of these different forms. If you have uh, FTD with motor neuron disease, you're highly likely to have frontotemporal uh, lobar degeneration with TDP43, um, as is the case if you have semantic variant of PPA. But uh, if you have the non-fluent variant of PPA, uh, and especially if you have the behavioral variant of FTD, you may have one or the other, and that's really where we need the biomarkers to help us out. Occasionally, we'll find that people with one of these presentations uh, have a form of Alzheimer's disease as the main pathology, but uh, with older people, that can often be accompanying the primary frontotemporal lobar degeneration pathology with increasing age. So here's a mapping of the major uh, cognitive behavioral syndromes onto the pathologies that are most likely associated with them. This is uh, the progressive amnesia that we think of as typical Alzheimer's disease that's usually associated with Alzheimer's disease pathology. There's the progressive aphasia that could be any of these types of pathology, but with probabilities that are related to the particular variant or subtype of PPA uh, with the um, non-fluent agrammatic variant usually being associated with FTLD tau, although still sometimes being associated with TDP43. The semantic variant usually being associated with TDP43 type of FTLT, and the logopenic usually being associated with atypical Alzheimer's pathology. Uh, changes in vision, the so-called posterior cortical atrophy syndrome, usually being associated with Alzheimer's disease pathology, but not always. The changes in socio-emotional behavior that we label as behavioral variant FTD are usually associated with one of the two types of FTLD, but we don't yet have good ways of determining which one. And then progressive supranuclear palsy, as I mentioned, is usually FTLD tau. Cortical basal degeneration is usually FTLD tau, but sometimes can be due to AD as the main pathology. And then um, dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's disease dementia are usually associated with uh, alpha synuclein pathology, which is what makes up these different uh, Lewy body or Parkinson's type pathologies. Uh, and then ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease is um, ALS pathology, which is actually a form of TDP43 pathology that ends up uh, in some cases being related to FTLD TDP43. So a really complex intertwining of these pathologies and of the clinical and pathologic relationships, making our job that much harder. So here's what we'd like to be able to do eventually, which we're not there yet, we'd like to be able to image molecules in the living human brain with tau and amyloid PET and other kinds of tracers to not just know where the brain shrinkage and disrupted function on the MRI or the glucose PET scans are, but to be able to determine, is this person tau positive and amyloid negative, which we're not really able to do yet, or tau negative and amyloid negative, which might then in the right uh, setting, uh, like BVFTD, be suggestive of TDP43. Uh, or are they tau positive and amyloid, amyloid positive, which would at least be suggestive of primary Alzheimer's pathology. Although, as I mentioned in older people, you can have that along with FTLD and have mixed pathologies. I wanna talk about the genetics of FTLD. Um, most FTLD is sporadic. Some of it is familial and some of what's familial is inherited in an autosomal dominantly inherited fashion. What I'll show what I mean by that in a minute, but the um, 
majority of FTLD is sporadic and uh, a, a smaller amount is familial. And this small yellow wedge here, probably about 10 to 15% of it is strongly uh, familial with a um, inheritance pattern that's obvious often in younger people. These are the three main genes that are responsible. Uh, we all have these genes, but specific abnormalities in them can lead to FTD. This is an example of a couple of family trees or pedigrees as they're known. Uh, and what you can see in terms of um, um, autosomal is that either um, men or women can be affected. Sometimes it looks like more women are affected or maybe more men in a particular family. But what we know is that it's equally likely that a man or a woman can be affected. And it's dominant, meaning if you get one of the, um, the one copy of the abnormality that your parent had, then you're likely gonna get the disease. So in this case, the um, grandmother uh, had the illness, likely passed her um, abnormal copy of the gene down to her daughter, uh, one of her three daughters, but not to uh, her son or other siblings. And then um, this daughter passed that down to uh, her son, uh, who was our patient, um, but not apparently to other kids in the family. So for each person, it's 50-50 if they have one of these genetic abnormalities running in the family, which is a big question that has to be established first. Um, and we typically will test the symptomatic patient to see if they have one of these abnormalities genetically. Um, it's not typically useful to test an asymptomatic person if we don't know the genetic abnormality that runs in the family. In this particular family, uh, it looked like it skipped a generation, but in fact, that was because the um, patient's mother uh, died at a younger age than she would have expected, been expected to have symptoms. So um, we always try to collect as much information about the biological relatives of the patient, starting with their parents, including age at death if they're deceased, uh, their parents' siblings and their grandparents and grandparents' siblings to try to figure out how old were people when they died? Did they have a neurologic or psychiatric illness that might have been FTD but might not have been diagnosed as one? Uh, or did they have some other neurologic illness like ALS that might we now know be related but not have been thought to be related before? So here's a result from one of our studies that came out in early 2020 from the um, two major consortia in the world that are working together to try to study FTLD in both sporadic and inherited forms. And what is now known from this study is uh, in the largest sample of patients that's been looked at so far, if a, a family has a MAPT mutation, the average age of onset is 49, but a, one standard deviation on either side of that is 10 years. So it's a pretty broad age range. But if that takes you up to age 59, then what that tells me is that by the time a person is 70, if they're in a family with a MAPT mutation, they're probably um, past the window of when people would usually develop symptoms. With progranulin and C9-ORF72, that's about a decade older. So, um, age of onset on average is 59 or 58 in these genetic abnormalities. The um, GenFi in Europe and um, Artful Lefties in the US are studies that are looking at uh, people with familial FTD in their families, whether they have symptoms or not, to try to understand more about when biomarkers might become abnormal prior to the onset of symptoms. And so what this shows is um, that when people are uh, genetic, when they're carriers of the genetic abnormality, we think they may begin to show changes in molecular biology, changes in neuroimaging, and subtle changes in neuropsychology before they really start to show clinical symptoms. Uh, and we wanna try to understand the relationships between these things, because these might be the clues to being able to measure whether treatments given prior to the onset of symptoms could possibly slow the progression of the disease and delay symptom onset. One of the encouraging things that we learned from the study already is that lifestyle factors seem to be a resilience uh, seem to be resilience factors in people with uh, autosomal dominant FTLD, and so people that had higher levels of baseline physical activity or higher levels of cognitive activity of a variety of types seem to have a slower rate of progression over time. So we're now really able to use this evidence to say that these things matter and are things that you can do to try to help protect yourself if you're in a family and want to try to do everything you can to reduce your risk. We and others are doing studies of stem cell models of human genetic abnormalities of um, 
FTD and related conditions. And so we can take a skin biopsy from the inside of a person's arm, especially people with these particular genetic abnormalities that I was just talking about, and reprogram their skin cells to uh, turn into neurons in the Petri dish and grow them with that specific person's genetic makeup in the lab. And we can relate that to things like imaging and postmortem uh, brain tissue analysis. And what we can do with that is try to develop models of the diseases in the dish that can be used to screen treatments. So this is a, a model uh, from a um, patient's stem cells that were turned into neurons that you can see connecting with each other in, in the dish, really amazing feats of molecular biology and cellular chemistry. And the orange indicates pathological forms of tau that have been hyperphosphorylated and are beginning to aggregate inside the cell. And when certain kinds of drugs are, are applied to these Petri dishes, they can basically make that pathological tau go away. And so we and others are trying to use these uh, human stem cell models to try to harness another type of technology to screen potential drugs that we could try to then bring into clinical trials of the next generation of treatments. So um, some of the challenges there are that uh, we need to be able to identify people at the earliest stages of illness, even preclinically. We talked about the heterogeneity of clinical and pathologic features that make it hard to um, be confident in what our outcome measures might be. And we just had a meeting um, with the FDA and we do this on a regular basis to try to uh, maintain dialogue with the FD FDA and with industry partners in pharmaceutical companies and hear the voice of patients and family members in thinking about how to develop better outcome measures and engage people in this kind of research. We desperately need more symptomatic therapies to try to help improve symptoms, even if we don't change the ultimate uh, progression of the disease. Uh, and the ultimate outcome, I think, may be functional independence and quality of life for the patient and family, which may um, reach across these different specific syndromes that we're talking about. And we need better ideas for targets, things that we can measure that tell us that we're actually improving symptom functioning. And um, I don't have time to get into that right now, but that'll be the topic of another, another conversation. And then for disease modifying therapies, there are a variety of approaches to protect brain health, uh, but uh, there's a lot of work now to try to focus on specific disease modifying therapies. Uh, and we're especially doing that with people with different genetic forms of the disease uh, to try to uh, uh, see if we can develop treatments prior to the onset of symptoms. But there are a lot of challenges in those that the whole field is grappling with, but making progress with. I want to make sure to thank all of you for participating. It's you, through your efforts that we're able to make advances in our clinical practice, our education, and our research. Uh, the investments that you make in allowing us to do brain scans or do cognitive testing uh, or do behavioral studies or uh, do stimulation of the brain or do other kinds of studies or give us a, a small piece of skin or a little bit of blood or spinal fluid um, or ultimately do brain donations. It's through all of these generous activities that you give us that we're able to make the advances that we are trying to make. We couldn't do it without you, and we want to uh, express our, our sincere appreciation to you for all that you do in the fight against FTD, Alzheimer's disease, and related disorders. Thank you very much, and we wish you well, and stay healthy if you can. <laughs>